All right, Entre Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entre Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for, what is this, Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. Welcome back, everybody. We're back after a two-week break. Great to have all of you joining us today. I already see people saying hi. Great to have you here. Kurt in Flint, Michigan, and Chris all the way over there in Massachusetts. Benita, hello, and Atlanta. Margarita from South Florida. Yoko in Virginia. Yoko has identified herself, which reminds me, um, you see on the screen in the comments, some of you have pictures, some of you don't. Uh, some of you have names, some of you not, don't. Some of you are just known as Facebook user, which we've learned not to abbreviate. Uh, if if you want, if you show up as Facebook user, but would prefer to uh, show up with your actual profile, uh, there's a uh, URL in the bottom left of your screen right now, chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. Go ahead and click that and uh, give Facebook permission to uh, Publish your picture and your name, and uh, then you'll show up as as who you are instead of as the uh, as the Facebook user. If you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. But um, just throwing that out there in case you want to be identified as such. John Kenny, I see you listening. I see you. I hear you listening. I don't know. You're listening. You hear us. Great to have you back from Massachusetts and Jefferson. Jefferson says he's handing over the crocheted bathtub to Ryan Shoup. Congratulations, Ryan. First in today. Congratulations on the, the uh, grand award of the crocheted bathtub. Glad all of you are coming back uh, from, I see Facebook, I see LinkedIn. We'll see if we find any, uh, any uh, friends from uh, YouTube or Twitch today. Maybe we'll get another uh, troll from Twitch. That would be, that'd be mm. a good troll to have. I hope so. Yeah, we know that we have made it back. If we get a troll today, that'll be fun. Uh, Christian, we see you up there in Ithaca, New York. Everybody else, say hi when you get here. Good number of people coming in, getting it warmed up here. We're remembering how this thing works after being off for two weeks. So welcome back. Brian McCarthy, see you over there on LinkedIn. Glad that uh, glad that you're here. Nicole, <laughs> Nicole wants to know if she can troll from Facebook. You can, mm -hmm. but that should, question... You should probably take your name off there, Nicole, if you're going to troll. Just a tip. Yeah, so. and it, it, it makes me think that if you ask that question, you probably need the tutorial on trolling, <laughs> which you can download at entrearchitect.com slash troll. Uh, just go check that out <laughs> if, if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, thank you for joining us. Great to be back here today. We've got another great guest today here on our live uh, live conversation. I'm looking forward to jumping into this. So, Catherine, what did I miss? Other than two weeks, what did I miss? Yeah, two weeks. I think we should just jump right in. I think you're all set. Okay. We've said hello. Right. I'm saying hello from Massachusetts. Yeah, Catherine's back. Catherine's back in the house, off the vineyard. Yeah. Everybody's I back. Didn't, and I didn't have to leave Massachusetts to go to the vineyard, though, so yeah, it wasn't as, as big of a vacation as you had. Yeah, well, you're, you're stuck in the state. I'm stuck in the white box, and here we are. We're all back together <laughs> We're all stuck. again. <laughs> We're all stuck. <laughs> Joker's on the left. All right, here we go. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our guest today. I've been looking forward to this for a while, and there's a couple people in our audience that have been looking for, forward to this for a while as well. Um, our guest today is an accidental archivist and a Hepcat audiophile. A trip to falling water led to a late night Google search, which led to him being a founder, which led to him being an executive director, a tour guide, and a podcast host. He's a modernist soul trapped in a modern body and the purveyor of the largest open digital archive of residential mid-century modernist architecture in the world. He's no Mr. Rogers, but he is Mr. Modernism. George Smart, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hey, thank you. And and I, now I want to learn how to be a troll too. I didn't know there was a tutorial page <laughs> on that on your site, but now I know I can go there and learn this valuable skill. No, oh, it is a valuable skill. <laughs> I, I've heard there's uh, I've heard there's quite a career in it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, go to uh, entrearchitect.com slash troll. We'll have that PDF posted uh, before the show is over. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's great to have have you with us today, George. Um, 
like I said, there, there are several people that, uh, in fact, uh, I see Chris Novelli there in the comments. He's, uh, he did his thesis, his IMARC thesis, uh, and, and I'm sure he will. There, well, there he goes, right in the comments. It was on preservation of modern architecture. So um, there's a few Thank folks you, in this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your service right there. Yeah. <laughs> They're, 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 uh, Chris and others have been waiting a long time for this. So why don't I, I want to start out with this, you know, you're Mr. Modernism, U S modernist, uh, NC modernist. So those of you out there, um, that are listening to this NC as in North Carolina, which is where George lives. Uh, so U S modernist and NC modernist, um, why modernism? That's the, that's the question. Okay. Well, um, we could go many different ways with that. Like, why is modernism fun? Why was modernism popular? Why is why, it why not modernism popular? for you? Modernism for me is just because it's it has a good vibe. Okay, it feels happy and optimistic and about the future, and that was what was so attractive to most people who loved it when it came out. Is it was no longer about looking backwards or to styles of a hundred or five hundred years ago. It was not a classical view. It was a hopeful view. Uh, it was going to take us to the Jetsons. We were going to have flying cars and, you know, uh, robotic servants around the house and two-way wrist radios and uh, laser guns. We got the wrist radios, yeah, the um, wrist but we haven't gotten the laser guns quite yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm still waiting for my flying Mini Cooper, by the way. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe one day. So... <laughs> Okay, the, the follow-up question then, and, and those, if you've never listened to U.S. Modernist Radio, first of all, go to wherever you download podcasts, wherever you consume podcasts, go there and check out U.S. Modernist Radio. It's George's podcast. It's wonderful. It's a great mix of, of uh, modernism and, and music and, and a lot of things. So my second question is, why jazz? Why jazz? We have a music segment on the show, which we started about two years ago. And it's because if you go on some of these mid-century modern tours, what are they playing inside the house? It's jazz. Right. So we started inviting different jazz artists to come on the show, thinking nobody would show up. And we've had like 40 of them so far. We have one about every other show. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's a fun segment. I, I, uh, when I first found your podcast, and you know, I'm clicking around on, on different uh, – different titles and things. And of course I had to listen to the episode on the Ferris Bueller house. I lived in the Chicago. That was very fun. Yeah. It, it was, that was a great episode. Yeah. You know, I lived in, uh, in Chicago for about 20 years. And of course you've got to listen to the, uh, the Ferris Bueller episode, but, uh, but the, the jazz segment is fantastic. And it, it made me think, have you ever watched the show Bosch on prime on Amazon prime? Only every episode of every season, Jeff. So <laughs> go ahead, let's go with it. Come on, let's bosh a little. <laughs> it, it uh, you know, I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening to the, the podcast, Modernism. Got the jazz. I'm going Harry Bosch. Harry Bosch, exactly. Yep. And that house is a real house in the Hollywood Hills. Um, they don't they they don't shoot there live all the time. Just a little bit. They have a soundstage. It recreates the oh, inside wow. okay. yeah. of the house. But it's one of those stellar modernist houses that was built uh, between the late 40s and the early 60s with the spectacular view of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, very similar to the most famous house in L.A., which is the Stahl House, okay. uh, which has been in so many TV shows and movies um, and in that same general vicinity. What's what's the name, or is there a name for the house that's in the the show Bosch? Um, it doesn't have like a, a popular name, right? Okay, um, but it's it's a real place. If you go on Google, you can look it up and see pictures of it. I think there are even some old MLS listings. You can see photos of the inside. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as, as you're talking, is the Bosch house? So now it's got a name. Is the, is the Bosch house in your archive? It is not because we are organized by architect. And so we've not gotten to that particular architect yet. Got it. Um, what we'll do is take someone like Pierre Koenig, who designed the, the stall house, 
And then uh, our research team will dig deep and find every house that Koenig designed and sometimes some unbuilt ones. And then we'll put all of that online as one great documentation of his work. Uh, and we and we should say, you, you know, I skipped over this part. You know, we've got sort of a circu- circuitous route to this this point that um, on usmodernist.org, org, um, as I mentioned in the intro of for George, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the largest open digital archive of information on uh, mid century modern, especially residential, I guess, mid century yeah, modern. Houses, okay. Yeah, we have about two terabytes of content, which is a lot. That's that is in a fact, lot. In um, fact, when we started out, we, we couldn't find a server in North America that we could afford, so we ended up moving to Germany uh, for our server services. And <laughs> now America's caught up. So I think we're in Kansas somewhere now with Dorothy and, and Oz. See, that's, and that's backwards. where everything lives. <laughs> Not in Kansas anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, well, one of the things that, that just blew me away when I, when I saw this on your website and I've heard you talk about it on, on your podcast as well is the scanning of all of the, the magazines, the old magazines, because I, I'm sure everybody that's watching right now, or listening to the, the podcast version of this later in the future, um, probably at least at one point, maybe still has stacks and stacks and stacks of architecture magazines around. But you and your team, how many pages of magazines have you scanned for the archive? We have scanned 4 million pages <laughs> as of a couple of weeks ago. We're like deranged monks who've had too much wine over the old scrolls. And we just keep <laughs> scanning and scanning and scanning and scanning. And, uh, and it's been so fun. And the cool part is that for the first time, all these materials are now text searchable by keyword. So you can go inside the magazines and look up a particular architect or house or uh, some detail. And we try to preserve as many of the ads as we can, too, because that gives people contemporaneous information on the fixtures and fittings and furniture that existed during the time that the house was published in the magazine. That's that is amazing. Go ahead, Catherine. I was just putting this up here so I didn't lose it. No. I was muting myself. So yeah. you can go ahead and I'll just ask when, when it comes up or, or okay. this kind of fits in, I think, about about the timing of modernism and Yeah, when we're when we're talking about modernism, and so we, for those of you that don't know, we we preview all these conversations on the Clubhouse app every morning in our coffee talk at nine o'clock in the morning. And and we got into this conversation this morning about what is modernism. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Ed's, Ed's uh, question here, I think, fits right into that. I can help you solve this problem, Ed. <laughs> so is, is there a we, way we, to constitute what is mid-century modern? I mean, I, I don't pretend to be the final arbiter of this because there's so many opinions. But we use four criteria to establish a modernist okay. house. So the first one is uh, uh, an unusual geometry. It's not just a a box with a a gable roof on it. Uh, Secondly, we're looking for a flat or a low-pitched roof. So those two things there knock out most houses. Um, Thirdly, we're looking for uh, abundance of light sources, many windows, big windows, courtyards, atriums, skylights, anything that makes the outside and the inside tend to merge together. And then finally, although this is nothing new by today's standards, what was radically new back in the day was the idea of the open floor plan, where your living room and your dining room and your kitchen were not separate rooms anymore, but they were part of one continuous space that you could flow around. If a house has those four things, it's probably modernist. And that separates it from, uh, as Ed said, those crappy ranches (laughs) from the 50s and the 70s. So how did you, you know, your, your story, and I alluded to this in the introduction as well, story starts with a, or, or this chapter of your story starts with a, a visit to falling water. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece up in, in Pennsylvania. Um, how, how did you get to falling water? So it actually started about six months before that in January of 2007. 
one very dark and stormy night <laughs> when I was minding my own business, Googling, and found a couple of modernist houses near where I live in, in Raleigh. And they were just fascinating. And there was one in particular, which we now have on our homepage, which was called a Catalano house. And it was this gorgeous house with a hyperbolic paraboloid roof, but it had been destroyed about five years previous, which was just tragic. So I thought, wow, wow, something is affecting me here. It was like that scene in Alien where the little monster erupts from the guy's stomach. All of a sudden, architecture had exploded in my DNA. And this was true because my dad was an architect and I had no interest in architecture before that moment. Hmm. But all of a sudden I did. And um, that turned into an all night session on the internet. So by four in the morning, I realized that when I was six or seven years old, my dad had taken me to some of these houses and I was having these flashbacks now of having <laughs> been there. Really? And so after that, after that, uh, you know, psychological experience, I thought, well, I'll just make a list of houses and, and try to keep track. And that list turned into a bigger list and then it turned into a website. And then I went to Falling Water because, you know, you got to make the pilgrimage to Falling Water. And when I came back, um, that turned into a project to build a new house for me. Hmm. Um, there's that scene in an old movie called um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind mm -hmm. where uh, Richard Dreyfus stays up all night uh, building a monument of Devil's Tower out of mashed potatoes. <laughs> well, yep. I drove to Michael's. The, the craft store and bought sheets and sheets of uh, foam and some pins and stayed up all night building a model of the house I wanted to have. I call this falling water fever. This is what happens when you go and you get <laughs> possessed of all this. And uh, about two years later, I was in that house and I'm talking to you now from it. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to reproduce it in mashed potatoes, but um, <laughs> no. do you still have the model? That would be hard to do that kind of house in mashed potatoes, I think, but yeah. do, you, do you still have the model, George? I do not have the model. It is gone, mm -hmm. but I have some photos of it somewhere. That would be fun to see those someday. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we talked about this morning on Clubhouse was, you know what, and, and Ed said, or, or Christian said, it's interesting that you gave those four criteria and didn't um, mention an age, didn't list a, a, a right. date range there. Right. So I, I know some people consider modernism to be just all mid-century, but we consider it to be a style rather than a time period. So you've got houses coming out of the ground now that are very modernist in nature. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that that's we we kind of kicked that around a little bit this morning. Is you know, is, when when does it start? When does it stop? It's interesting that we call it modernism, and it's a, it could be a historical style. It's, you know, what's, right? That that's a fun debate to have with a city council trying to preserve some of these things. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense because um, you know some of these modernist houses still look like the future. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking a city council to give historical preservation status to something that looks like it's not old, that's a right. tough sell. Uh, is, so, and, and that's a, that's a big part of your, your movement, if I can call it that, I guess, is, is the preservation of, of, uh, these structures. And, you know, there, there's some, there's some great stories, some language on your website about, about, uh, you know, bulldoz bulldozers, uh, great and sad, I guess, at the same time, bulldozers, you know, plowing these things down. Um, where, at what point did that, and I guess it goes back to the house that you just mentioned, um, losing some of these structures, um, how, how prevalent is that in North Carolina, across the United States? How, where does that start to become so poignant for you? Well, it's, it's not as prevalent now as it was before, which we're very, very happy about. Um, modernism fell out of favor really in the late 60s, early 70s. People were tired of it. Uh, material science had not quite caught up to architects. So a lot of houses have been built that had some structural issues or had roof leaks or things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, today, material science, you can pretty much 
build anything that you can design. So it's not so much an issue as it was. And then after that happened, people uh, kind of forgot about mid-century modernist houses for a long time, really until the mid-90s when they were super cheap and people started either tearing them down and making McMansions or preserving them and bringing them back to life. Uh, one of the best examples was in Palm Springs, a Richard Neutra's Kaufman house, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Brent and Beth Harris, um, you know, brought back from uh, almost being de deteriorated beyond the point of no return <laughs> and uh, invested in it and, and brought it back to it. Really, it's original, pristine condition. And that's happened all over the country, not just in Palm Springs. Um, up until about 2013 here, we were still losing houses. But part of what we did was we started a central registry of houses that were for sale because our view is you can't save these houses in an 11th hour rescue when the bulldozers are in their front yard. You have to get them at the moment of vacancy and, and advertise the houses and, and let people know their history. Um, many realtors don't know the history of these houses, and so they use our site to figure that out. Interesting. Yeah, I remember seeing something about uh, you know needing needing to have an owner in order to save it, and I, I'm sure it was stated much much better than that on your website. But that you, you have, have to have the owner the or the owner's family or heirs mm -hmm. at least interested in the conversation because you know people's private property is their private property, so it's really their call. Mm -hmm. You can't come in in most cases and just you know harass them around to save it. But many times there are resources that the owners or family don't know about, uh, different ways to subdivide the property, uh, more efficient methods of fixing a particular property. Um, if you ask your cousin Earl to come over and give you an estimate on your mid-century modernist house, uh, Earl's probably not going to know a lot necessarily about modernist design. So there are people who specialize in this and can give more accurate figures, often less than people have been quoted. Hmm. That's interesting. And and for those of you, both in our live audience now and on the uh, podcast version, uh, one of the things that I love about U.S. Modernist Radio, George's podcast, is the stories of all of these homes. Uh, and and some, some, sa some saved and some lost. Um, but uh, it, it's really interesting to listen to the story of a specific home um, and, of course, related to the architect, et cetera. So that's, that's fun. We also have a series called Children of Genius, where we interview the kids of famous architects. Oh, that's perfect. And that's, that's fun to do on multiple levels. I mean, one is we talk about the houses and the buildings, but also we're finding out what it was like to grow up in these households where, you know, the vibe and, and often the, the, the friends that hung out there and the whole way of life was very different. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I heard the episode with Neutra's son. Mm -hmm. um, just was that Dion or Raymond? It was Raymond. Raymond. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dion sadly uh, passed away last year Oh well. uh, in his nineties. Okay. And uh, Raymond is now continuing his father's work through the Neutra Institute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. What's Pam got to say? Well, she wants to know, she says, do you think the modernism comeback, which I guess we're in, will fade out and then postmodernism will start trending? I'm already seeing signs, she says. So what do you think? She's in California. Well, you know, I kind of expected the modernism trend to fade before now but it's really going very strong. Mm. I mean, people are still uh, adopting modernist furniture by the truckload for their homes and apartments. Those have shown no signs of, of slowing down. Uh, commercial office spaces are now ordering more classic furniture really than they ever have before. And of course, you know, postmodern is, is getting a little older. Postmodern is what happened after modernism faded out. So building between about 1975 and about 2000, roughly. Um, in 2025, we're going to start hitting the 50-year mark. So mm -hmm. that is a threshold at which a lot of preservation uh, standards and designations kick in. And it'd be a really interesting conversation about those buildings and, and what we should preserve. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that is a, a really interesting question when it comes to preservation. It, and it, it strikes me that, you know, may, maybe part of the problem as well is not only do these do modernist homes look like they're from the future instead of from 50 or 60 or older or more years ago, but these are these are buildings, some of them, and I guess maybe even more specifically the postmodern, we've seen these things be been constructed. How can it be that old if I watched them build that building? How could that be historic if I watched that under construction? Because sadly, yeah. Jeff, we are now historic. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, I'm going to the council about that. <laughs> this is a good question from Brian. Brian Brian wants to, wants to know, well, he says, this may seem like a naive question, but I'm curious, other than history, why should these houses be preserved? We kind of, I can, I'm assuming some things from what he said, but anyway, go ahead and answer that. Assume he. Well, you know, um, we have great examples of many styles that have been preserved. Um, particularly in the South, the mill houses and the mill villages. Um, we, a number of those have been saved over time and, and have really turned around quite well. Victorian houses uh, that were once all the rage in America. Um, a number of those have been saved. I mean, I think it's important to save the the housing trends from each era as we go along. But specifically for modernism, um, we do a lot of tours, and typically on those tours, there's a couple, and one person in the couple is the modernist, and the other person in the couple has been dragged along by the modernist, and it's mm -hmm. just just not that much into it, or doesn't quite understand what all the fuss is about, and. Um, I would say at least half the time, once they get inside one of these houses and spend a little time and see how it's organized and how the light comes in, they start to understand that the vibe of modernism really is delightful and is quite different from you see in a regular house, even a very nice regular house. Mm. And for that, that's why we think they should be preserved. Can anyone live in a modern home, a modernist home? Um, I think so. I don't think there's any restrictions. There's no <laughs> law. <laughs> what What if you don't have the right furniture, though? Don't you kind of need to have kind of the right furniture to live in? I mean, to live well in a modernist. House? Well, you know, um, there are some purists out there who mm -hmm. would say you do have to have all the right stuff. But, you know, my bar is, is pretty reasonable. I just want people to keep these houses from being torn down. If right. they want to put um, rooms to go in there, it's fine by me, really. <laughs> uh, you know, whatever people are comfortable with. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people like the minimalist approach and keeping things more sparing and, and putting things out of sight. And some people look like a, a, you know, a cracker barrel exploded on the inside of their house. Either way is okay. <laughs> <laughs> cracker barrel. What, what is a cracker good. barrel, actually? It's is a restaurant a full of knickknacks and cheese. Oh, you mean the restaurant? Oh, that kind yeah, of Cracker yeah. Barrel. I thought yeah. I always thought the namesake of that restaurant was something else. I don't yeah. know what a Cracker Barrel is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But here we have this. Um, I don't know who Vapor Rift 007 is, but um, they say, I think modern homes did not catch on because of materials. I'm seeing more being built now that use rustic materials and finishes. Any thoughts? That's, that's true. I mean, and there are different variations in modernism. For instance, um, in Asheville, North Carolina, in um, the Rocky Mountains, there's this kind of mountain modernism, which uses a lot more stone and great big timbers, um, which is not like your classical Mies van der Rohe kind of modernism, but very sharp, very nice. And, uh, and those are amazing to look at. Do, do the, um, you know, you mentioned material science catching up. Which is, you know, and I think this might have been in the episode about um, about the Ferris Bueller house, and it, it was the the homeowner was talking about replacing the glass, replacing the windows, yeah. which, you know, um, advancements in in window technology, I suppose if we want to say that, or, or glass technology. Uh, and insulation has changed a lot over the years. So, what what's the biggest challenge when uh, preserving 
some of these homes? Is it is it a structural challenge? Is it a retrofitting modern technologies, which seems kind of ironic, but my, modern technologies into the home? Or what's what do you see as the biggest challenge? Well, the two big enemies are always water and heat loss. Yep. That's it. Those are the two things you're chasing all the time, and they can take various forms. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, was your roof in bad shape? You've got water problems. Right. Um, if you got water problems, maybe you have mold and mildew problems too. Um, you know, so it really just sort of depends on on the house itself. I would say that that a lot of the houses are are just fine, but there are a number of them that really develop some issues, and you have to work on those when you remodel them. Yeah. Um, they're not as elaborate, I think, as as some of the houses, say, from the twenties or the Victorians, because they they were all wood, and didn't have a lot of utilities put in them, at least initially. Right. So it's. Uh, also, Victorian houses require an infinite amount of detail to bring back together. And to go visit a recently restored Victorian house is always kind of looking at a work of art. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I live in a historic neighborhood right outside of Indianapolis, right outside of downtown. And and uh, we, we've got quite a span here. There's plenty of Victorian. Uh, I saw Ed mentioned uh, earlier a Lustron house. We've got a couple of Lustrons here in the neighborhood. Oh, good old Lustrons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It. Um, I don't. I don't think we have anything that would – well – yeah, we we do actually have a couple that would I think qualify as as mid century modern in, in different corners of the neighborhood. Now, but, Jeff, uh, you have an entire town, Columbus, Indiana, just south of you. Yes, sixty <laughs> miles south of here, modern capital of the world, modern yeah. architecture capital of the world. Oh, amazing town! Anyone who's into modernism should make a pilgrimage to Columbus, Indiana, and spend a couple days seeing the. The churches, the houses, the office buildings. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. What, yeah. what? And I also want to put in a plug for a building in Indianapolis. Okay. Which um, I hope you haven't visited professionally recently. And that's the Ashkenazi Hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a brand new hospital. And it's just a stunning modern design. I was walking around that place. We got a chance to get a tour with their CEO and the architect. And by the time it was over, I wanted to check into the hospital just for some random illness because it was so amazing. Um, one of the many features in this hospital in Indianapolis was a rooftop garden mm-hmm. that you could go up to by elevator and walk around if you were a patient. And they grew food up there that they served in the hospital. Just outstanding. Yeah, yeah it is an amazing, an amazing project. <laughs> Sorry. And if anybody's headed to uh, to Columbus, Indiana, hit me up. I'll meet you there. Yeah. It's uh, an hour away from me. <laughs> I know so, Chris. Sorry, I know, go ahead. I, I was going to say Chris really wants to talk about this. So I'm just going <laughs> to um, bring up his comment because I know he's passionate about it. So Chris Novelli says, conversation has been mostly modernist houses, but there is a lot of potential in larger scale modernist buildings, brutalist that can be preserved through transformation and maybe go on to live a better, more integrated, more appreciated life. So. Ah, yes, the brutalists. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm a brutalist fan too. I, I think what has been done in concrete, both past, present, and future is astounding. And um, I'm also in the minority. A lot of people really, really, really hate brutalist buildings. Uh, they're controversial in most every location they are. Um, Boston has a couple of large major ones that are about yeah. 50 years old and they're having to decide what to do with these buildings. Um, if you go inside, they're really visually very arresting, uh, because they were designed by architects, um, such as Paul Rudolph, who was very famous for his concrete structures. Um, on the other hand, um, a lot of them are not necessarily that practical. They didn't necessarily work well for the purpose which they were intended. They had a variety of heating, air conditioning, and moisture problems. Of course, you know, it's one thing to peel back your wall in your house to fix an issue. It's another to try to to blast out a couple of feet of concrete to fix another issue. And you also have to keep in mind, just like our nation's bridges and tunnels and other concrete structures, um, some of these have significant deterioration issues, which are quite expensive to fix. 
So mm. it's, it's, it has to be kind of a tough call for each of the buildings, but I'm a big fan. I, I really love walking through um, some of those. Uh, and especially in Washington, D.C., um, they have a number of, of big brutalist buildings for government agencies. Uh, the, the Housing and Urban Development Building is one, the FBI building, and there are quite a few others. Yeah. Ed, My favorite Ed, is the U.S. Tax Court of all buildings, which no one ever goes to visit. But it's this very, <laughs> very lovely, you hope you don't go to visit. <laughs> it's this very, very lovely um, sort of black uh, building that was um, designed by an architect in Florida, and it's just stunning. Well, Ed wants to know why everyone else hates brutalism so much. I guess because they haven't gone to architecture school. That would be, I think, why. Uh, part of it, I yeah. I think also part of it is that um, a number of people have not been inside the buildings. I mean, that really is key. I mean, and, and I have complete compassion for the people who have to work in some of these buildings where what they're doing is not really compatible with what's going on. I, I'll give you an example. We have a lovely insurance building in our town. It was built by Home Security Life. And it, it's, it's just a stunning mid-century modernist building. But they sold it to the Durham police and it became a police station for the mm. next 25 years. Of course, an insurance company just doesn't work becoming a police station. So of course, the police hated it which means the city council hated it. And everybody thought this was a terrible building to get rid of. But fortunately, it has been saved for the moment. And when it gets converted into some kind of original use, like either offices or it could become condos, it'll be spectacular again. Now, I know because we talked about this this morning that part of, so Chris Novelli, who asked the question about brutalism, uh, before Ed's question, he did his uh, master's thesis uh, on preserving modernism, which we talked about at the very, very beginning. Uh, and one of the comments he made this morning was, or, or one of the questions he had this morning was, um, can preservation be transformative? And I think, um, and his, he just made a comment, my point is that preservation doesn't have to be curated. I think his point this morning was, what about, you know, some of these structures where the, may, maybe the use, the, the use does change as part of the preservation, the program possibly, um, maybe even looking at the original design that may not have actually been carried out the way, you know, the construction may not have been carried out the way it was originally designed. Have you seen any instances with whether it's brutalism or, or mid-century or some other type of modernism where the preservation of the building was actually accomplished through some sort of transformation like that? Well, that would require some long-term thinking, Jeff, and, and strategic planning. <laughs> it took a long time to ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're a little short on that in the, uh, in the building field. I mean, yeah. people just want to change out the light bulbs and go on with things yeah. and are not thinking that many chess moves ahead, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Unless you're doing your master's thesis. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that is the kind of group, uh, the people that are doing urban studies and master's theses and doctoral dissertations are the ones that are taking the more long-term view mm. and trying to give us better ideas about how to preserve these things ahead of the time that they're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. It's like Leslie has a question. Yes. Leslie says, can you talk about color? I'm a fan of Southwest modernism with Adobe and Pueblo influence and Luis Barragon lighting the way with desert color. So. Oh yes. Um, there, there are a lot of wonderful, uh, I'll just pick one state, Arizona architects, uh, Will Bruder, uh, Rick Joy, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had his Taliesin West, there. Um, and just like, you know, the goal of, of many architects is to have houses in particular blend in with their environment. So that was also the goal of these architects in making the materials that were used blend in with the desert colors, the desert textures. And of course, on a practical basis, be able to withstand the sun because that gets pretty high, especially now when it's getting into the 120s and 130s in different places. 
yeah, that, that's uh, that's beautiful architecture. Uh, what, one thing that you know, as I as I think about what you've created with U.S. Modernist, you know, going going back to the you know one stormy night, a dark and stormy night, and yeah, in the Google search, it, I, I don't. I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I think what you, you sort of created a movement here, um, or at least you're curating a movement or, or somehow facilitating a movement. Um, what does it take? And I, I, it may have been on when you and Catherine were, were talking on her podcast that, you know, what you're doing is all about modernism, but somebody else could say, Hey, I really love Victorian architecture right. and they, they right. could create us victorian or you know, exactly something. right what does it take to to do what you're doing you know whether it's create a movement or or what however you would define it well you have to have a little ocd that's the first step <laughs> because uh if you're not willing to like dive head first into the pool with no life preserver and not even sure if there's water in the pool <laughs> then you, this is not for you um, but with that said, it really is simple. And I'm encouraging people to do this all the time with various interests. They call me and ask how to do it. Um, contrary to popular belief, you don't need to be an architect. You don't need to be a historian. You don't need to have a degree in anything. You just need basically a car, a cell phone, and uh, you know a camera of some kind, probably your cell phone, and start driving around your community, uh, taking photos from the street of different houses, and noting the addresses, and then you can look those up and you can start building documentation on the houses. Um, it's also helpful to talk with the older architects in town because they remember all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk with people who are in their 90s and they don't remember who their wife is, but they can tell you every house <laughs> that they designed over the last 50 years, plus who they're pissed at from 1969. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that a bit. <laughs> so, so when when you um, when you look back, you know, go, going back to the dark and stormy night, yeah. What um, what do you think? And hopefully, there's momentum. You know, that's my hope that you've what you've done is generate momentum. And and you know, I assume you're going to be at this for quite a while. Um, at least through tonight, yes. <laughs> Depending on how the storms go. That's yes, right. Uh, <laughs> what, what's, what's been the result of scanning millions of pages and doing tours? We haven't even talked about tours yet, but doing tours and, and a podcast and the archive and everything else. What's the result of all of this work? So the result is, is that people have a place to go to find out the information that they need. And when I started this, and I started the various projects that we have, our master's gallery for houses, our magazine library for architecture magazines and the podcast, every time I thought, surely someone's already done this before to mm -hmm. this extent. And I was surprised to figure out that in, in most cases they hadn't. I mean, for instance, there, there were several architecture podcasts that were in existence, but um, they tended to be really, really serious and, 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 and like, you know, I wanted something that was a little more lighthearted and fun. And I, I thought, well, I'll just start this and see how it goes. And maybe we'll get a few listeners. Um, with the magazine project, uh, which is you can get on our website, usmarnist.org slash library. Um, that came out of a phone call with a Charlotte realtor. Um, he had heard that we were into this mid-century thing. And he's calling from the basement and he says, I'm down here in the basement. There are boxes and boxes of magazines here. Um, I think some of them are wet. Um, do you want them? It's like I had to think a minute and go, well, sure. Because, you know, if they were bad, I'd throw them away. I mean, what the hell? So we got um, what ended up being about half a million pages of magazines in that first great hall. And most of them were in fine shape. They weren't wet. So I went on eBay and I bought five scanners for like 50 bucks a piece, old Epson models. And we set up in my garage and, and aided by alcohol, we fed about half a million pages into these machines. And that started our first collection of magazines. 
And since then, we've expanded and have more volunteers. We have a scanning company now that does all the actual work from that. But we still have to process the magazines to get them ready for scanning. So, for instance, uh, when they come in, we have to shear the bindings off because we don't have, we take many lifetimes to do it page by page. And then we have to t- pluck out all the subscription cards and perfume samples and product samples and AOL CDs from the 1990s <laughs> and get all the crap out so that the magazine can actually be sheet fed into a big scanner. Wow. And then once that happens, it gets uploaded to the web and it gets indexed uh, by Google with all our keywords. And that means, you know, people can now use it. So, um, you know, that just started as a, a random phone call from a random Charlotte realtor. And are, now are, we're, we got 4 million pages. So are you still accepting magazines? Uh, my wife sadly says, yes. Uh, you know, they show up all the time, Jeff. I mean, like we've had pickup trucks come to the the, the garage and just want to offload. Uh, <laughs> and we, we take them and, uh, and it works out great. Um, you know, we, we get them from all over the country. A few have come from abroad, but it's expensive to ship magazines. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the postal service has something called media mail that people can use to ship things cheaply to us. I just got in two boxes today. So um, they'll go into the giant machine and get processed and be up, you know, in a little while later. Um, Our most recent uh, really uh, thing I'm most proud of recently with this is that we've been working with AIA National uh, for a number of years. And uh, they just sent us 700,000 pages of magazines from their basement. Mm. So these were all the state magazines like AIA Indiana and AIA Iowa and AIA Chicago that, um, you know, they don't have any room for it really much anymore and lend them to us to scan. So we're going to scan all those and send them back. That means they don't have to do it. So it's a good partnership. Nice. Nice. So uh, are there, this is almost like baseball card collecting at this point. Um, (laughs) Are there certain magazines um, that you want that you're, looking for or is it all serendipitous donations oh no we have a page it's usmodernist.org slash needed and you can go to that page and see all the ones that we need okay so it's all cross-referenced and updated this is where the ocd comes into place jeff we have all those (laughs) details so for everybody that's out there either in our live audience or in the uh, on, on the podcast later. Actually, this is a message for your significant others. If you want to get rid of those stacks of magazines that your significant other keeps hoarding, go to yeah. usmodernist.org slash needed and see if George needs those magazines. That's there right. That's right. Someone just put the link up for us. So thank you. Thank you, Facebook user Anonymous. You're welcome. That was me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not so I guess, you know, I usually anymore. stay anonymous, but you know, when I'm, you know, getting thanked, I have to step up and say, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'd like well, to help. <laughs> she's, she's here to help. I'm here to help. That's great. Um, uh, someone just asked about Iowa architect magazine and, um, and we just got that one. Um, we hope to have it online sometime during ours of September. And um, we have 30 years of that now. So, wow. yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. No, it is really amazing that all that is scanned and we can all use it. I mean, we can all use it. We can just access it for right. free. Right, it's just right, right there. Just right there. I-, I figured out early on that this was not going to work as any kind of, of financial model. People <laughs> do not want to pay for this kind of information at all. So we just abandoned <laughs> that from the get-go. Well, how is, how is U.S. Modernist supported then? So we're supported. We have, we have members. People can join the organization. Uh, we have very wonderful donors that, uh, that help us with funding for various projects, including this scanning project. Uh, and our main source of income is from our tours. So we take people on modernist tours all around the U.S., Europe, and uh, this fall we're going to the Middle East. We're taking people to Dubai for the World's Fair which uh, is going to be just amazing. 
And then uh, in America, we take people to Falling Water every year. We take people to All Brass in South Carolina, which is another Frank Lloyd Wright project. We take people to Palm Springs for Modernism Week, which is uh, kind of the Super Bowl of modernism every year. And we go to L.A., New York, Chicago. And then we have lots and lots of local events here in North Carolina. And that's where the bulk of our revenue comes from. Okay. Well, so, I was thinking that we could have an entree architect tour. I'm just throwing that out there and planting the seed, George. Okay. And everybody else. Well, we have we have ways we could do that. Indeed. Yeah, I, I think we should do that. Not this summer because we have our thing planned already, of course. It's short notice, but maybe okay. maybe next year. Yeah, sure. Yep. I think we can I think we can do that. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. So uh, Ed Shannon says, What do you do with the magazines after you scan them? Don't tell my wife, but I will take them. Oh, Ed. Uh, oh, Ed. Ed, have you been no. listening? That's millions of pages. Yeah. So, Ed, if you ever want to contact me and come pick up some of these things and put them in your pickup truck and take them back home, you are more than welcome. Because <laughs> we have to recycle them, really, after we've, we're done with them. Um, they're not rare in terms of being sort of financially valuable. And they're in lots and lots and lots of architectural libraries. But we were the first to scan them and make them available digitally to everybody. Ed, um, we won't tell your wife, but yeah. uh, you yeah. might want to be careful. <laughs> yeah. Hope she's not on Facebook, Ed. She probably <laughs> listens to this podcast, Ed. Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I think she's live right now. You're going to have some explaining to do, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> she shows up as Facebook user. <laughs> and, and she just asked a question, Catherine. Ed's wife asked. <laughs> what did she ask? Did we invite George to Ecclestock? Oh, yeah. No. Would you, George, would you like to come to Ecclestock? It's in um, very northern Vermont at uh -huh. a... Um, a resort with a water park. I don't know how modern it is. I haven't been there, but it doesn't seem like it'll fit with that. But anyway, uh, jo Jeff will be there. I'll be there. And is a this number where we of have to crawl in the mud while rock and roll plays around us? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> actually, find me up. Oh, yeah, the, sum the summer of love. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, August thirteenth. I can send you the details yeah. later, George. Please but do. we would love it if you would come. Well, please Seriously, do. it would be kind of fun if you were there. I, I, I wasn't aware of it, so it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be architecture and music. Okay, mm -hmm. it, in all seriousness, yep. It that's true. Live music and talking about architecture. Yeah, and t shirts too. T shirts, Ben t and Jerry's. Ben, ice I have t shirts. Ben and Jerry's. Jeff's coming all the way from Indiana just for the tour of just the factory, which is unfortunately closed due to COVID. Aww. But I guess we'll. I guess we'll go to just the outdoor window. Yeah. Yeah. That's close enough. It's it's better than going to Kroger. Yeah, true. <laughs> well, I'll send Thank you the you, details. Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This episode brought to you <laughs> by Kroger. <laughs> by Kroger, your modern grocery store. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is kind of an interesting question from um, Rod. Not surprisingly, but he says, do you have any archival documentation on former military base housing, much of which is MCM and most are occupied? And the answer is yes. We have tons of information on this because um, mid-century modern architects designed a lot of military housing between about 1955, roughly. It was a move to modernize the, the campuses of the bases. Um, and they were all published generally in some of the architecture magazines, and also in some of the military magazines, which we don't have. But uh, you can find references to those in the, um, in the magazine library if you know the name of the base. And a lot of these bases had neighborhood names, you know, like uh, Battleship Acres or, you know, something like that. <laughs> and, you could, and you could look up the little neighborhood within the base. <laughs> 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 battleship okay. Acres. Yeah, Battleship Acres. Okay. It's a lovely little community. Yeah. <laughs> on I'm the trying water. to imagine that. <laughs> on, on the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Cookouts on Saturdays. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Chris asked a question a minute ago, since we're still sort of in the magazine mode about um, 
do you have any uh, uh, any university contacts? They may have some of the uh, the things that you're missing. Well, they do, but they don't want to let go of them. Yeah, they mm-hmm. get chopped up, and so um, we tend to specialize in um, universities that are closing libraries. Mm. So I got a call a year ago from the University of Hawaii at Manoa that was closing one of their library buildings. And a very wonderful librarian there was distraught about the fact they were going to throw away, you know, thousands and thousands of magazines. And um, although we paid for it, uh, she arranged us to ship 46 boxes of those magazines from Oahu that we got and digitized. And uh, that was a wonderful contribution by the university. Oh, nice. I want to speak to Chris uh, about the uh, rabbit holes that he's going down and looking at the collection. So um, this is a common problem. Um, (laughs) We are, we are, we are, uh, we are a little dangerous to visit because it's highly addictive to get on our site. Um, I get emails at least a few times a week from someone who discovered it, say nine 30 at night. And by three 30 in the morning, they're sending me an email going, Oh my God, I can't shut this thing off. (laughs) <laughs> um, so be careful when you log on because it could be a while <laughs> a warning. Significant... you've been warned everyone yeah, you've been you've been yeah. warned yeah. yeah yeah i feel like there ought to be a lot of warnings that go along with this conversation today <laughs> <laughs> yes the following material may be disturbing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. may disturb you into the wee hours of the morning Oh, this is uh, this has been a lot of fun, a lot of fun conversation, and and um, it's fascinating to learn about the the journey. And uh, you know, I go back to what you said just a few minutes ago, starting with a uh, a cell phone in your car, you know, driving mm-hmm. around. You know that that may be a big takeaway for anybody, whether modernism is your thing or, or lust run, whatever it is, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I I um, love that. A lot of people say, well, I don't know how to start a website. Well, you can go to Google sites, S I T E S. Hmm. And if you can operate Microsoft word, you can operate Microsoft. I mean, you can operate Google sites and it's a drag and drop interface that you can plug in text and photos and build yourself a very simple little site. And you can upload all those photos that you were taking from your car. And then send it to your friends and say, you know, do you know who designed this house? Do you know when the house was built? Um, Anything like that. And that's that's just how it gets started. And then once people know that there's a place they can contribute to, then it's when you get volunteers. And we have we've had dozens, maybe several hundred really wonderful volunteers over the years that have contributed Mm -hmm. through that crowdsourcing kind of way. Yeah, that's great. Um, great. Byron is saying, do you take furniture? And the answer is, yes, we do. Um, during the pandemic, we started accepting donations of mid-century modern furniture. <laughs> and um, we have a, a truck and a crew, and we'll, we'll go pick it up from different places. And what we do is we auction it off, and the funds go to looking at our preservation and documentation operations. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, that's very cool. So now everybody that's looking for uh, furniture for your house, buy it on auction from uh, usmodernist.com. Right. We get we get tons of, you know, the classic stuff, Noguchi tables, Barcelona chairs, Eames chairs, Carbusier loungers. Mm. All right. I'm going down that rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just said dot com. It's actually dot org. So us dot modernist dot org. Um, sorry for the misstep there, but uh, but uh, it, John John says this has been a fun and interesting talk, and uh, I agree. That George, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun, and um, you know I'm looking forward to the next episode of US Modernist Radio and and the music that will will go with it as well. So. Uh, uh, for everybody out there, remember usmodernist.org um, is where you can find all of this information that we've been talking about today. The archives are there, information on the tours, um, the master's gallery, uh, which we barely touched on, and um, and you can check all of that out there. You, you know, 
use at your own risk. Uh, you may not, uh, you may not come yeah. back. You may not be seen for quite a while, but that's right. Uh, we do have a 12 step program for people that get into it too far. <laughs> like, hi, I'm George and I'm a modernist. <laughs> and that's under the resources tab at usmodernist.org. Yes. Right. <laughs> and, um, and also wherever you consume podcasts, U.S. Modernist Radio. It, it really is. It's a, it's a delightful podcast. It's a lot of fun. Mm. Um, it, it is. is uh, yeah, it's a lot more fun than a lot of architecture podcasts. You are very right about that, George. <laughs> well, I really like it. There's a theme song, and I sing it really badly. So you have that to look forward to. <laughs> I was wondering if that was you. It sounds uh-huh. like you. Yeah. Can you sing it right right now, George? A little. Oh wow! Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Mama don't need no architecture around here. Mama don't need no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow. Gonna make mine modern anyhow. Mama don't need no architecture around here. There you go. That is beautiful. beautiful. And with that, we should adjourn quickly before the hordes come. (laughs) The servers are lighting up. (laughs) Thank you for that, George. Really appreciate that. That's that's the best ending to the show we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I see that uh, Nicole has uh, jumped over to Twitch so she can be a, a troll now. So that's the first oh, step, Nicole. Yeah, Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Her trolling career is uh, is well on its way. So, George, again, thanks. Really appreciate you. Thanks for thanks for U.S. Modernist. Uh, honestly. And uh, to all of you out there, thank you again for showing up after this this uh, two week break. Appreciate all of you for all of your comments, all of your questions. I'll be back again tomorrow. Actually, Catherine and I both will be back again tomorrow. Uh, yep. Same bat time, same bat channel, four p.m. Eastern. Tomorrow we will uh, take up our uh, mini series again called Member Spotlights, and we'll have a mystery member tomorrow and as long as jeff doesn't ruin the game <laughs> we will uh, we'll try to guess who the mystery member in the spotlight is tomorrow so join us for that um until then uh, i appreciate all of you take care of yourselves be well be safe still a lot of stuff going on out there so keep yourself safe and well and those around you uh as well and uh, take a little bit of time to breathe tonight rejuvenate somehow come back again because we're going to do this all over again tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate all of you. And we'll see you again somewhere sometime soon.